Bizarre Brain Comics. Gary here for Bizarre Brain Comics. This is where I like to take a look at some older comics, talk about the creators, the characters, the art, and the and the stories. Space battles, weird, strange aliens. and romance under trying conditions. What am I talking about? Could that be Star Trek? Star Wars? Flash Gordon? Well, could be, but I'm not. I'm talking about Buck Rogers in the 25th century. This is a book from, uh, that is the adaptation of the feature film, Buck Rogers in the 25th century, which then spawned a well-known TV series. And if you're younger, it's possible that you've never seen these. But, they were, but it was very popular at around 1980, 79, 80. And there's a lot of fun. And uh, as I said, this is an adaptation of the movie. So let's see what the big bulk of knowledge has to say about it. Buck Rogers in the 25th century, the comic book adaptation of the 1979 film the adaptation was done by writer Paul Newman and featured the work of artists Frank Bowl, Al McWilliams, and Jose Delbo, all of whom I've, I've talked about before. And of course, it's based on a comic strip, and it's with the comic strip is a science fiction space opera created by Philip. Francis Nolan, based on his novel Armageddon 2419 AD. The strip was originally drawn by Dick Culkins, and the novel was published in Amazing Stories magazine, the pulp science fiction magazine. And the strip debuted in 1929. In the novel, the character's original name was Anthony Rogers, but it changed to Buck for the uh, for the strip. Uh, it had more of a, a butch sound. So to it, kind of makes it reminiscent of uh, westerns, which were very popular at the time. Okay, and the, uh, the strip was wildly popular, and soon spawned a radio show, as well as competition in the form of Flash Gordon. And years later, a movie serial w uh, was produced starring Olympic swimmer Buster Crabbe who had already starred in two Flash Gordon serials. And the strip was discontinued in 1967 after being pro uh, produced by a variety of creators. The, the strip was rebooted in 1979 in conjunction with the release of the film and TV series and loosely followed the updated origin of the character rather than, than the original origin. Even in the, the movie serial, they changed his origin. And meanwhile, Gold Key Comics produced a comic book adaptation of the film, followed by a short-lived TV tie-in uh, comic title, from uh, running from 1979 to 1982. And that was, uh, had a three-issue, three, uh, 
adaptation in standard comic form, and then this large old tabloid sized reprint. So, let's go for a journey into the 25th century with Buck Rogers. Yes, Buck Rogers in the 25th century. And you can see this cover is a photo collage of uh, still photographs from the film. Same goes for the back. Uh, there's a, a well-known image there, the Starfighter. Okay. As I said, uh, Buck Rogers started as, of course, a comic strip in 1929 with the art of D uh, Dick Calkins. And here, featured in this this book, is a reprint from the those early days of the comic strip. And uh, it's a real nice nice cover. But you can see just a little sample there of what it originally looked like. And uh, also, probably one of the reasons why uh, Flash Gordon eventually eclipsed it in popularity was was because uh, although an, an accomplished cartoonist, Dick Calkins was not nearly the draftsman that uh, that Alex Raymond was. And we just talked about Flash Gordon uh, just a few a few weeks ago. And one well, one little bit of uh, of. Uh, Trivia, here's, this is a really nice cover, due mo primarily to the, uh, the, the lovely uh, coloring on it. This, and this book is from 1988. It just so happens that, that this cover was designed and colored by Bruce Tim, who might be better known as one of the producers and artists for Batman the Animated Series. So this is some of his early work. Okay. And uh, along with with the, the comic adaptation and then the, the reboot of the comic strip, there, were, of course, was a novelization. Of course, Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Nice painted cover. Um, again, featuring the, uh, uh, the actors from the movie. And, of course, this is a text novel. There was a second novel also based on the series, which, from what I understand, was based on an unproduced script for a, a, a second um, full-length feature. And also, this is a little, uh, a little bit of sweetness here, is Buck Rogers in the 25th century photo novel. And it's just what it says. It is done comic strip, basically a fumetti, uh, featuring photographs from the film with uh, dialogue balloons. And several years ago at a local convention, I had the distinct pleasure of getting to meet Erin Gray, who played Wilma Deering, this lovely young lady right here. Of course, she's not nearly so so young any, anymore. I think she's in her 70s now. And she's a was a lovely, lovely actress. And so she signed my copy. She when I handed that to her, and she thumbed through it. She just thumbed and thumbed and thumbed and and said, "Oh my gosh, I haven't seen this in years." So it's been now I've probably had this for over twenty years, and she uh, the signed copy, and and she said, said she hasn't seen it in decades herself. So. So that was a lot of fun. I have a whole bunch of others, and I'm going to plan on doing a doing a, a video just about the photo novels and the fumetti and stuff. And that is all I want to cover about that. Other than over time, I noticed that these photographs have kind of faded and and uh, not as sharp and clear as they once were. Over, t over time, so I just hope they last. Okay, Buck Rogers in the 25th century. And another photo collage on the inside cover. And it talks a little, little bit about, about it here. So it starts off just like the, uh, the opening credits of the TV series and the movie with the launch of Buck Rogers 
on the top of a rocket and with his spacecraft Ranger 3 who's going and he is uh, going solo on a five month mission that's kind of a tour of the uh, of the solar system and uh, anyone who's seen the show realizes that this is not what his ship looked like no and it has a brief uh, briefly describes what happened he was something ha uh, something happened to his ship and he was which which put uh, froze his con ship's controls and put him in a state of suspended animation for 500 years coming back back around and he's coming back and he's fired upon by these by the ship and here's his killer cane looking through his ship ship's window seeing the spacecraft and they put it uh, uh, a tractor beam on it and pull it into the giant the giant star destroyer um the draconia and i notice nowhere at no time do they sh show the in actually show this giant ship the draconia draconia in this adaptation i I'm, i suspect when they when they uh were working on the art for the this they didn't have a uh a photograph of that ship and here is an interesting little bit of uh oops trivia the, <laughs> the ship here that killer kane is flying and and and, and pulling uh, buck roger's ship into the uh, the mothership is not the the ship that that uh killer kane would have been flying this is actually buck roger's spacecraft from the movie <laughs> except it was all white Looks looking a lot like a space shuttle, and they 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 pull him out, find out he's he's still alive and suspend an animation, and they reanimate him. Here he's being brought before or being told about with uh, Princess Ardala, and here she's wearing the costume that she later wears at a banquet. So they're just following the uh, the, the photographs, and it's the the uh, the visual storytelling is is nicely done. It's this is the work of Frank Bull. Here Buck is brought back. They're suspicious of him, possibly being a spy. Don't know. He's all drugged up. And there we see Tiger Man in the background. And they're concocting what to do. They uh, put Buck back in his ship and send him towards Earth. And unbeknownst to, to Buck, there is a little transmitter in the ship to, uh, to hopefully provide a a map of the uh, the way through the the energy shield which protects Earth from invasion, and the sh the Draconian people were were uh, uh, coming supposedly for a uh, uh, um, a peace deal. For the uh, Draconians were going to protect Terran shipping, space shipping, uh, where, because they're dependent on on uh, alien support. Alien worlds for uh, many of their consumables, and have been harassed by pirates. So it's been a lot of their shipping has been cut off. Here we have uh, Wilma and company uh, flying up in their starfighters to intercept Buck and have him follow them down on on threat of death. And he, here in this story, they they have uh, found a bomb on his ship. Well, bomb. He doesn't know anything about no bomb. And then only later they find the transmitter, and they they suspect him. Of being, he tells him his story. He barely remembers uh, being on the Draconian ship, and they they suspect him of being in league with the pirates. And here is when he meets. Of course, he's just met Wilma Daring and Doctor Hewer, who is in charge of the Earth Defense Directorate. And here he's meeting the little cute little robot Tweaky. And Dr. Theopolis, who's just this box around his neck, he's part of the computer council, and they're interrogating Buck. And this is when Buck finds out he's at 500 years in the future, because he doesn't know what the heck's going on. And, of course, he finds out they're suspicious. He's getting a, uh, a tour around the ship, the city, to uh, see, what's, uh, see what life was like. Um, there was a holocaust. Uh, some kind of nuclear exchange. Most of the most of the people, most of the world, most of the cities were destroyed. And then this this city, their inner city, uh, New Chicago, is near the ruins of the original Chicago. And uh, 
is one of the primary cities of on the planet. And Buck is just not happy, unsatisfied with the answers he's getting, because as far as he's concerned, they are, until he f sees some evidence, some proof, this isn't real, it's a dream, or someone's faking him out. He said he's going to go have a look. Uh, he's just not going to believe it. And then he shows the uh, that someone had fired on his ship and as proof that he, he said as evidence that he had been intercepted by the Draconians. And he doesn't trust the Draconians. But they all do because they're so dependent on it. Well, she, she zaps Buck with a stun ray. And here now is when they discover the, uh, the transmitter on his ship. And we're back on the giant... Star Cruiser Draconia with Killer Kane and Princess Ardala. Wonder, uh, wondering about Buck's fate. He, the uh, thing had been, they f discovered that the transmitter had been discovered. The bomb did not go off. Now in the novel, I don't rem recall any bomb at all. There was no bomb in the in the movie. And this is, and, and the movie was a little bit re-edited. Because uh, the, um, the novel... Pretty much follows this story, and a few things are different, um, which is due to some rewriting and re-editing later. Uh, but overall, it's not not that important. Here, Buck is being is as uh, being tried as a uh, as a pirate, and he is to be banished to the outside, ruined, radioactive world of Arcadia or uh, Anarchia. And Tweaky and Theo go with him. And here the and Tweaky is is frightened. He goes biggy biggy biggy. He's cute. He's kind of a kind of a combination of both R two D two and C three PO here. And there there are mutants who live out here in the ruins of the city. And they come back in the city. They come with a, with an idea as an excuse to take uh, uh, to save Buck. And because they do kind of like him and halfway believe him. To uh, uh, to intercept the draconian ship and board it to uh, to check for weapons because it's supposed to be unarmed. That's just a, an excuse. Okay, so here they go. While while Buck is out there trying to stay away from the uh, the pursuing mutants, Buck finds a grave for his his own parents. He's from Chicago, but there's uh, no date. All in, all, the whole family was all in one, one grave, and he says that's that was the way early days of the uh, of the Holocaust, the uh, the apocalypse, whatever they called it. And uh, here we go, part two. And here, this is from the second issue, and this one is drawn by Al McWilliams. And here he's holding back the mutants with a torch. And fighting while they're trying to get Tweaky, they're they're pounding around on signaling others to come, because they can get uh, uh, they want to scavenge off of the the robot. He gets Tweaky. They take their meanwhile. Well, uh, while they're out and about, Wilma and company they scare off the the, the mutants and get Buck back, and they fly out to the. Draconia, supposedly as an as an escort, and it gives them a chance to to check on the ship. Now, I have some really nice nice drawings here of uh, of these spacecraft. They must have had a uh, good photo reference uh, for these, but they didn't have the Draconia. This is as close as you get to seeing the Draconia <laughs> here. And here we got our. Uh, Princess Ardala and Killer Kane getting ready to receive these fighters. Really nicely drawn. Uh, some more original costuming. And as as uh, Al McWilliams is wont to do, he puts the princess in a turban. I don't know why he likes to put turbans on 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 some of these ladies, but there she is. Very very nicely drawn. Uh, some nice detail and uh, in the background, it kind of resembles the the set in a way. Whether from the movie, 
And meanwhile, they are being, then they're suddenly come under attack because this was their plan. When they learned that they, Cain learned that they were going to be, uh, be boarded, he had sent out his own ships uh, in hiding and then to, were instructed to attack because because his ships are the pirate ships. These are the pirate ships and the ship is under attack. So the earth fighters take off to fight off the, the pirates. Now th these look absolutely nothing like the hatchet fighters that the, the pirates used, which were actually draconian fighters. Uh, and, but this is a common type of design for Al McWilliams. As I uh, mentioned in the, uh, when I did that last Star Trek episode, uh, which was drawn by Al McWilliams, uh, he had some, some ships that looked very similar to this. And this is the kind, uh, kind of design he often uses for spaceships. Just variations of it. But the, the starfighters are just, just beautifully drawn. And I really like like the, the visual storytelling in these panels here. This is Buck. He's instructed not, uh, he's told not to engage. And the starfighters engage their combat computers. And they're being wiped out. Using their combat computers, Buck takes his off. He is a skilled fighter pilot in his own right and takes uh, takes things into his own hands and starts starts uh, dishing out some little death to these uh, these pirates. And uh, this is where I really like this this series of panels here. You see Buck from the, within the cockpit. The view he sees is he's zipping around, getting behind the enemies and blowing them up. Boom. Here he is coming to the rescue of Wilma. Some more nice, nice, uh, nice space battle scenes. And then they return to Earth and she chews him out for, for interfering. But he saved her life and the rest of, of the squadron. So here they are. See, that's a really nice figure of Wilma right there. Of course, and, but the women in the, for the comic are not done quite as sexily as they were in the movie. The costumes are, aren't quite as tight. But it's very nicely done. That's not a criticism. So, <laughs> Buck was going to gonna be sent back out to Anarchia, but then they get a, a message from Princess Ardala she, uh, for her reception. She wants Buck Rogers, so he has to be, <laughs> he saved once again. And here he is about ready for the reception. He has, says he has a, a headache, wants some medicine uh, for Tweaky to get for him, and a rose. So here's a, a pre-programmed uh, message from Draco, the leader of the Draconian Empire and father of Princess Ardala. All talking, all talking friendship, 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 while he actually has an attack force on the way to back up the Draconia. So he gets a rose and gives the rose to the princess, then asks to dance. Wilma is not happy. She's on the jealous side. And finally, so is Cain. So finally, uh, Ardala has to, has to take off and says a shit, asks him to meet her later. Meanwhile, Wilma, she kind of gets close, almost up to, to a little bit of uh, uh, canoodling, but not quite. And he kind of blows her off and takes off, meets up with Princess Ardala. Here she is in a turban again, even though she's got a different costume. And he takes the the, the uh, medicine that he got, had gotten for the relaxant, he had gotten for a headache, pours it into her drink, and just knocks her right out. Meanwhile, Cain is, com is uh, consulting with Draco. And Buck zaps Tiger Man. All this very nicely done, very well. Some really nice visual storytelling. Uh, of course, that, that door doesn't look very ship-like, especially spaceship-like, but... This is on the, the launch hangar, and here's here we go. Start part three. This is uh, the the rest of the of the movie. 
um, uh, the, the third part of the adaptation. And this one part is drawn by Jose Delbo, who I discussed on a Wonder Woman episode. Yeah, yes, he did a lot of this stuff. He also did a lot of work for DC. He uh, worked uh, on, on Wonder Woman for, for a few years uh, during the time of the uh, Wonder Woman TV series. So he's sneaking around the ship, uh, knocks out the guard, takes his, con uh, takes his uniform. Meanwhile, see Twe uh, Tweaky and Dr. Theopolis who had been instructed to follow and keep an eye on Buck, had snuck aboard his ship and there, thereby snuck aboard the uh, Draconian ship. And they're sneaking around. They Now that Buck is in, in uh, enemy uniform, he realized, he thinks that Buck is actually working for the Draconians and he sees all these ships. The, the Draconians are the pirates. He sees that and sneaking around, sneaking around, and they... Here they confront Buck with the blaster and said, Theo, Tweaky, what are you doing here? Because they think he's a traitor. He says, have, well, have you ever th heard of loading bombs into the tailpipe of a fighter? Then they wrote, oh, <laughs> he's he's sabotaging, their, sabotaging them. Meanwhile, they've discovered the guard that he had attacked and uh, check on the princess. And she is alone with Tiger Man, not happy to have him in her bed. But that's where Buck put him, and he he just just zaps him uh, instead of uh, executing him, as instructed. Buck has Tweaky and Theo find a communication station and contact Wil Wilma and Doctor Doctor Hewer on Earth, and here that's what they're doing right now. And uh oh, okay, he tells them what's going on. They're actually the Draconians. Are actually enemies. They're about to launch an attack, and here they're getting in the ships, getting ready to launch the attack because they are inside the, the defense shield. And here comes really nice drawing of all these these fighters. That must have, must have taken a while to, to get them so so precisely. And and when the fighters are being launched. Then they explode, kablooey, because of the bombs and the tailpipes. But he didn't get a chance to to um, sabotage all the ships. But most of them are coming out and explode, just exploding. And Wilma has it, has her people take uh, shut off their uh, combat computers and go fight uh, fighting on manual control. Some of the, some of the ships coming out and are not. Here's a nice big splash page of uh, the space battle ensuing. Some of the ships are still exploding, but they're being de being defeated. Kablooey! Now they're ex starting to explode on the on the flight deck. All kinds of things going on, and Draco transmits a message. He is not happy, not happy at all, because it is uh, they launched too early under Ardala's orders. So he is not a happy camper. More explosions. Everyone get away, get out, and Buck is is trapped by, by uh, rubble. Meanwhile, Princess Ardala and Killer Kane get into uh, an escape pod, and they're going to get the heck out of there because they realize their ship is going to be dust. More battle outside, and, and Wilma's coming in to, uh, to rescue uh, Theo and... And Tweaky, and then they say, "Well, Buck too." He said, "He, he is the one who's responsible for all this." Oh, okay. They come in. Well, even though, though the uh, hangar hangar deck is in ruins, she manages to make a safe landing. While well, Tweaky uh, rescues Buck, and they take they head off to the and catch a ride with Wilma again. Another really nice drawing of that starfighter. And get out just in time as the whole ship explodes. Who knows how many thousands of draconian soldiers were destroyed in the process. Nice flying colonel. Couldn't have done it better myself. <laughs> and there, there they are off. I said, okay, we're... And Buck becomes a hero. And in the process, you know, this part was completely left out of the movie. And that one of the... See, Killer Kane was from Earth. And then... Uh, left and became a went to work for Draconia. Before he left, he had um, compromised one of 
the programming on one of the, the computers from the computer console, Dr. Apol. They find out that he was he was a traitor. And uh, he's the one that uh, had let them know, the enemy uh, know about the, uh, the combat computers and, and how to defeat their fighters using the co combat computers, which is why when they shut the co combat computers off, they were... Uh, the Earth forces were able to to destroy um, their the enemy fighters, and Buck is a hero. Wilma is a hero. Tweaky's a hero. All's well. Oh, Earth is saved. Ta da! That's the end. Except for coming up for the regular series. So here you can see this is probably why they thought the ship was Kane's because there is a Killer Kane in front of Buck's ship, and they thought the artist thought. It was supposed to be Kane's ship, not Buck's ship. Another good image of the the fighter. And that is all I've got for this Buck Rogers in the 25th century. As I said, it was um, originally published by, by Gold Key, and it was reprinted by Gold Key. But apparently they had a, had some kind of a agreement with Marvel Comics to, to produce this oversized edition. Therefore, it says Marvel Comics Group right there. Meanwhile, here on the... The Indicia, down here at the bottom, it says, published by Western Publishing Company, which is Gold Key Comics. So, and this is longer than I had wanted, but it was basically uh, briefly covering three issues. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you've never watched uh, the Buck Rogers TV series or the movie, um, I and you like science fiction, I really encourage you to, uh, to watch it with tongue-in-cheek, because it is kind of campy, but it is a lot of fun. Lots of action and adventure. And uh, it's just fun to watch, especially all the lovely, lovely ladies on the show. And and uh, the lady viewers got a big kick out of all the shirtless scenes with Buck Rogers, Gil Gerard. Okay, thank you very much for joining me. Like, share, and subscribe. Share it with your other comic book friends, uh, comic strip friends, or, or just sci-fi friends. And remember, comics are art.